I'm going to start us off with a prayer, and we're going to hop into some worship. Lord God, we love you. Lord God, we praise you. God, I just ask you to enlighten our hearts. Help us to see you more clearly, Lord. Help us to lead us into a time of worship this morning where we magnify your name, Lord. And we just ask you to, to give us, increase our faith so that we can worship you more rightly. In Jesus' name, amen. Up 
everybody. Welcome to the table. My name is Pastor Kinnan, and uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. If it's your first time with us, we just want to say a special welcome to you. We're glad you're here. A couple of things I want to uh, make you aware of is that we have um, a uh, ministry fair that's going to be after church, after the last service in this room next Sunday. And uh, that's a really a great place if you're new around here or you haven't found kind of your place to serve in. That is a great place to connect. Uh, we are going to have all of our volunteer opportunities that we have in the year coming up uh, spread out in here. And uh, you can sign up. You can also um, uh, 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 Apply for Ministry Safe if you want to work with children or adults so that you can uh, be with them. That's a background screening process that we do here for all adult volunteers who work with our children and youth. Also, I want to give you real quick an update on our Growing Hope campaign. This is a project that we uh, launched this year that's to reimagine our gym into the Blackwater Center for Community Enrichment, where we are going to provide an after-school program, and we're going to impact this community and make Jesus Christ famous. Is that okay with you? Okay. Let me show you what's happened. In a project that totals $600,000, we are over two-thirds of the way there. And so we have had over 400 grand pledged in three-year pledges. And we want to thank those families and those households who participated. I know you would never wait and do anything last minute, Blackwater. I know you wouldn't. But I also know you as your pastor, and I want to be real. So if you haven't pledged, would you please turn in your pledge card? Because I need to close that uh, campaign at the end of this month so that we know um, what's going to happen next is whatever we end up collecting, our finance team and our trustees will take that amount, and they will right-size the project according to the pledges that we've received. And that's how far into that vision and project that we will move. As your pastor, I will not take you into debt. Do you understand? <laughs> so we are going to right size. Amen. Can I get an amen for amen. not going into debt? Thank Woo! you. Yes. So we always want to run our ministries and do that by the support that the congregation gives to the vision. And we also want the Holy Spirit leading that. And we never want to, we never want to move beyond what God is providing because God provides exactly what we need. Do you believe amen. that? Okay. So that's how yes, we're going to run with that. And so with all of that said, I'm going to invite Miss Megan up and she is going to help us to receive our offering this morning.
<laughs> we share a little page, you know. So we receive our offering in five different ways here at the table. On your table, there is a way to give online. If it's your first time here, just enjoy our service. We give through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. I would like to thank you all for being with us today.
scripture for us today, but, but before I get into that, I would like to tell y'all a little bit about the youth trip we went on and to thank y'all for all of the support for all of our fundraising efforts. We really appreciate it because I had a great time. So thank you for trusting Aaron to lead the youth of this church. It is both an honor and a privilege to be a part of their formative years. We returned home last Sunday from one of the most impactful experiences of my life. This trip truly fed my soul. I got to watch Caden leave the state for the first time, manage his diabetes, which he was recently diagnosed with, resolve conflict, and communicate effectively. I got to work alongside him during one of our service projects at Karen Share, and he was on top of it and helping in every single situation he could. Luke kept us in check and let us know how to be more effective in the most logical way. I am very happy that we were able to get Caleb back in the van because he pled a very strong case for staying in Colorado. <laughs> Landon led by example. He set the pace for our partners and housing project. He kept Aaron in the boat on our rafting day. <laughs> he got all the boys to help when it was time to load the vehicle or clean it out. Just a phenomenal job. Gracie was my bestie on this trip. She set the pace for our service day. She worked us very hard and I could not keep up. She is the sweetest and we are so lucky to have, us, have her in our group. Hope helped keep everyone motivated during our cleanup project with Partners in Housing. It was really hard work and she wouldn't stop even though I was like, you really, you, you've done, you can sit for a second. Please, please drink some water, it's hot. Um, she kept the laughs going and was a great motivator this entire trip and she made sure that my hair looked good every day and that was necessary for me. Um, Brennan, he made our group whole. He joined youth just a few weeks prior to the trip and I know that that was a God thing. The trip would not have been as amazing as it was without him. He is such a blessing to us all. Jack and Kai, they did everything together. They kept the laughs going, the experience is fun, and the trip a once in a lifetime experience. Thank you, Jesus, for these children and these families to go out and be the hands and feet of your mission work here on earth. My prayer is that Blackwater's Amplify Youth Group continues to grow and reach the children that need a safe space just to be themselves, to learn and grow closer to God. Amen. Okay. Candace, would you like to come up, my friend? Good morning. My name is Candace Cowart. Um, I don't know some of y'all because this is my first time at this service. I always go to the traditional service. Uh, so, so one of my ministries, or my main ministry, is education about drugs. Um, I'm very passionate about this. So <clears throat> if you don't realize it, we are losing an average of six people a week. I mean a month, sorry, not a week, thank goodness. Six people a month in the city of Central to drug overdoses. That's just in our small community. Six people every month are gone from us. That's brothers, sisters, children, grandparents, friends, people that we love, people that we don't know. And it's a senseless way to die. This is a preventable death. And the only way that we can combat this is education. Blue Cross has recently produced a series of videos. I have thousands of these cards. Please take them. I'll have them in the back. You scan the QR code and it takes you to our website, Fentanyl Kills. There's a series of videos. One's a public service announcement. Two are videos from families in the community, one of which is Dara Bliss's family that tells the story of their tragic loss of a child. But this is not the focus of what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you, what I want to talk to you about today is how to save a life. This is Narcan, Narcan, Naloxone. This is a drug that about 90% of the time will reverse a drug overdose. It will not do it every time, depending on what drugs have been taken. But even the drug fentanyl, which is the big killer on our streets right now, this drug will reverse an overdose of fentanyl in almost every situation. We have AEDs, automatic external defibrillators, three of them in the church. 
There's one in the adult education building, one in the children's building, and one in the hallway between the sanctuary and this room. If ever on our campus you find someone unresponsive and you don't know what to do, the first thing that you do is call 911 or you direct someone else, a specific someone. You call 911. Then you go, you get the AED out of the little box, and when you grab the AED, you grab the box of Narcan that is sitting beside it. You go back to the person and you immediately administer Narcan. If it is not a drug overdose, if it is a heart attack or whatever else, Narcan will not hurt the person. Okay, it will not cause any ill effects to them whatsoever. But if it is a drug overdose, it will very likely revive them. Once you administer Narcan, do not hover over the person. It is very likely if it is a drug overdose, when they come back, they are going to come back very angry and swinging. So do not hover over them. Move away from them. Sometimes it takes a second dose. I'm going to show you what it looks like. I can do this with one hand. This is what Narcan looks like. It's, go, it's nasal, and it's made, juggle my hands, it's made so that it fits like this in your hand. You put two fingers on top, that automatically puts your thumb down on the bottom red plunger. You stick it inside the person's nose, you forcefully push the red plunger. Do not prime this like you would prime nasal spray for allergies. Don't do that because the drug is then in the wind and it's not going to work. Insert it into the person's nose, forcefully push the red plunger, it will administer the drug. Wait a few minutes, if the person has not come back around, use the second one. There's two in every box. But again, most important thing, call 911 first, get the AED in the Narcan, administer the Narcan, and then do what you're supposed to do with the AED. This is life-saving. We do not need to lose anyone else to this very senseless death. I'm in the back if you would like to handle the Narcan, look at it, or get any of the little codes with a QR code. Please help me save lives in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Candace. <clears throat> so for scripture today, we're reading out of Corinthians 12 through 20. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be mis misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the fruits of those, the first fruits of those who have died. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So one of the highlights for me on the youth mission trip that we went on, by the way, did I just tell you I'm glad to see your faces? <laughs> Whew, eight days is one, a long time. We were in Dallas worshiping last Sunday, and uh, I have to tell you, as much as I enjoyed being there, it, we really missed you. Uh, so I want you to hear that. Uh, one of the highlights, though, for me on that trip was about the halfway point of the trip, we went to Garden of the Gods. It just sounds beautiful, right? Well, it was. Have you been, anybody yeah. in the room? Okay, cool. Garden of the Gods, spiritual place, beautiful. Think mountains and flowers and beautiful trees and just amazing, yes, rivers. and Gorgeous, gorgeous place, right? It was really pretty. It's kind of like pretty in the way that our prayer garden is pretty, right? It's just beautiful. It's very serene feeling. Um, and so it really puts you in touch with nature. And perhaps if you can't uh, think or never been in either one of those gardens, you have a garden or a place in the woods or something that you just really love. And I want to ask you real quick to just imagine yourself there a place that brings you peace, a place outside where you experience the beauty of God's nature. And then I want you to imagine that a storm rolls in and it causes 
destruction and chaos. And a garden that you loved that was once vibrant and full of life, well, it's left in shambles. I want you to think about how the flowers are uprooted and the soil is scattered and then everything seems bleak. And, and amidst all that devastation, you notice in the ground this tiny little seedling. It's not much, but it's emerging. It's a fragile little shoot, barely noticeable, but its vibrant petals start bringing color back to the garden as it grows. And its fragrance begins to fill the air with sweet smells and hope. And today we're going to do the beginning of a two-week sermon event called End Times, because we're very fixated and fascinated about the end times. And we're going to explore whether we are actually living in those and whether we are just before the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. And today's passage is going to help us with that. So let's dive into this word and let's discover the truth that it holds for us. Would you pray with me? God, we ask that you would search our hearts and our minds, that your truth would be spoken. And Lord, that it would be something we can live by, something that we can leave here changed by. For God, what a pity it would be for us to hear your word and not be changed by it. I ask God that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would please you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. When it comes to end times, there are some obstacles, right? When we start talking about these kinds of things. And I like to lay those things out. I like to talk about them. And I don't like to dumb down Christianity, right? I like people who ask real questions and explore their faith and who engage from the right where they are. And we're all in different places in our faith journey. And so if you're sitting here this morning and you are skeptical about some of the things that the Bible says, I want you to know that's okay. You're in the right place. Maybe you've read things in the Bible that you kind of completely object to. Maybe this whole thing of resurrection from the dead is a hard one for you. That's okay. You're in the right place. Some things I want to also acknowledge is that you may come from a worldview that kind of puts you where you are. <laughs> if you've never been in a church before, if you've never even experienced a worship service, and your worldview is purely secular, you may have walked into this place with kind of skepticism and materialism in the forefront. Human achievement tends to be in the forefront of that worldview. So this idea of a great mystery of the Holy Spirit and divine intervention and resurrection and all these language things that we talk about in church, they may be a little hard to wrap your brain around, and I want you to know that is okay. We're not looking down on you. You're here to seek. We all are. You may be here this morning and willing to admit that you simply lack any personal experience or encounter of this Jesus Christ whom we keep talking about, and that is okay. It is. You may have never seen an experience where Christ has changed someone's life. So that may give you no concept of what we're talking about. In today's world, we place a very high value on evidence, proof. We want proof, right? And that's important. So when it comes to matters of faith and a topic like end times, we're looking for proof. You may have walked in here this morning with all kinds of preconceived notions. We do that, right? Oh, Christians, you know Christians, <laughs> right? Baggage, stuff. It's okay. Cool. I walked in here this morning with that. So it's okay. We're going to hear, have you here and meet you where you are on this. Things that you hold against religion or Christianity, specific denominational beliefs. Listen, the list is miles long. Misunderstandings. Anybody ever have a negative experience in a church? Thank you. Yeah, right. It's okay. The biggest one that I perceive in my pastoral ministry here at Blackwater, the biggest obstacle to having a conversation about something like resurrection and end times is by far fear and uncertainty. 
It's boo scary to talk about end times. It's boo scary to talk about final judgment and second comings of Christ and all of these things. And that unknown nature of the future and things like judgment and tribulation and all of those things, those end time prophecies that hundreds of thousands of books get written about, they can scare the socks off of you, I'm telling you. They really can. So let's unpack this scripture. Let's grow in our faith. And that means that we are going to be patient with each other, that we are going to show empathy to one another for where we are in this moment. And let's everyone be willing to have an educated, an intellectual, and a dialogue, and a thoughtful opinion about these things. Can we do that together? Say amen. amen. All right. Now, our ministry at Blackwater is to give you credible, biblical, historical, and experiential evidence sharing our personal testimonies with you and demonstrating the transformative power of Christ's resurrection through our lives to help address barriers that will help lead us all towards the acceptance that we are in in times and that Christ was raised from the dead. In this passage, the Apostle Paul addressed a significant concern within his church in Corinth, the denial of the resurrection of the dead. Some members of that church were totally cool with saying, oh yeah, Christ, yeah, we're on board with that. Christ raised from the dead? Mm, not so much. See, that's what was going on. You must remember that when this was written, Christianity is kind of in its first iteration, right? It's in its first generation. So they're trying to figure out, what did God just do? <laughs> like, what is God trying to do? And so Paul emphasized in this letter a non-negotiable belief in the resurrection of Christ. Not just in his life, but in the future hope of all believers through Christ's resurrection. So you see, the first thing that we take away from Paul's writing here is that hope is grounded in resurrection. Now, I want you to look at the person sitting next to you and say, hope is grounded in resurrection. <laughs> it is. It's the first thing about Christianity that we must get right. No resurrection, mm, no hope. Therefore, the second thing that we must get right is when we want to have an intelligent and an informed talk about end times, we must have an intelligent and informed talk about resurrection. You see, the Apostle Paul and the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, they agree. John Wesley held a strong belief in resurrection and its profound impact and salvation. Wesley held that the resurrection of Christ was the central component of the gospel, the very foundation that everything else is built upon. And a proper understanding will align with Paul's message here of hope, emphasizing the connection between Christ's resurrection and our faith. Those two things are inseparable. Resurrection and faith are inseparable. Therefore, resurrection and faith go together. Hope is grounded in resurrection. Resurrection and faith go together. Hope, resurrection, faith, birds of a feather. Let's have an informed conversation. Paul agreed that if there's no resurrection of the dead and Christ had not been raised, then both the good news and our faith are powerless. Powerless. He said if Christ hadn't been raised and you're still living in your sins, then everyone who's died with their belief in Christ just perished. Nothing else happened. It's only good while you're here. See, there's no eternal anything. There's no hope for tomorrow. It's just kind of like hope for now, right? But you know, remember that garden I asked you to, minute, uh, to imagine a few minutes ago? That garden, it represents our broken world. It was beautiful, but then devastated. And then I ask you to think about that devastation. And, and that's our, 
are marring by sin and suffering. I asked you to think about how the flowers were uprooted by the storm, and that represents our frailty, human frailty, subject to decay and death and the storms of life being blown about and scattered. The flowers that were uprooted They resemble how we feel sometimes. And why does it matter? Well, it matters because as we consider if we're living in end times, this passage offers us a reminder of the significance of Christ's resurrection. See, Paul is teaching us along with the Corinthians that the resurrection is not just some event that happened on April 3rd of the year 33 AD, but on that day when the sun came up over the empty tomb. And the stone was rolled away. That the victory belonged to God. Because in the Spirit's resurrection and raising of Jesus Christ, the grave was no longer the end. That's what happened. That's the power of the resurrection. And because of that, a new hope in Christ disrupted Satan's plan of death and destruction and storms and tribulation because God answered with the grace of a choice of eternal life with God. Resurrection was God's cure for a broken world and also a cure for our unbelief. Remember the delicate seedling that emerged in our garden that I asked you to, rem- to imagine? Well, that represents the resurrection of Christ. Just as the rose brings beauty and hope to the garden again, the fact that Jesus rose brings beauty and hope to the world because there is transformation power in his resurrection a renewal of our own broken lives, a renewal of our own world. See, when we ask things like, when is the date? And people start answering that. That's against the word of God. Here's what God says in Matthew, but about that day and hour, no one knows neither angels nor heaven nor the son, but who? Only the Father. So why write a bunch of books about something you don't know? See, it's not for you to know. That's why it's called the great mystery of God. It's not important. You see, when the end times, it's the wrong question. The right question is, is Jesus' resurrection real? And does it have real transformative power in my life right now today? Does it give us hope now, and does it give us hope in the future? That's the question. Church, here we live out our faith in a cradle-to-grave discipleship. As we sit here and consider and await Christ's coming, which the Bible is clear on, I just want us to do these things. I want us to pray. (laughs) Cultivate a deep prayer life. To serve others with selflessness, thank you and you for leading our children into selfless acts of reconciliation. Being the rose in the garden of Colorado Springs. Engaging in acts of justice and reconciliation. Not the kind that we like where it's mercy for me and justice for you. (laughs) But mercy for all people because God is just. Not because of what we've done, but because of who God is. I want us to practice stewardship, to fund vision, God sized vision like that community center, so that we can impact this community for God and to foster our own personal journeys. As we journey through this, let us be like that little seedling embracing the hope of Christ's resurrection by living out our faith with vibrancy and urgency and compassion and grace. Then we can be instruments of God. 
We can be ambassadors and agents for transformation for our families in this community. We can make our neighborhoods better. We can make our schools better. We can make our homes better. And we can make Jesus Christ famous in all of those places. May we, church, in our thoughts concerning end times, hold fast to the resurrection, living with commitment to love God and others. And may the fragrance of Christ's resurrection power permeate our lives and draw us and others to the experience of hope found only in Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. He sat at a table with friends. And he took bread and gave God thanks And he broke it. He said, it's my body. It was devastating. Words. Broken for you. Every time you eat it, remember. But then he took a cup. And he said, there's a new covenant in town. See the resurrection power of Christ. It wiped away your sin. It cleaned your heart. It made you capable of forgiveness you never dreamed you were capable of. It gave you power to walk in the authority of his resurrection. And he said, every time you drink it, You remember me. God, I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, the Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, Lord, upon these gifts of bread and juice and make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we may be the body of Christ, one with him, one with each other, and one in ministry to this world. God, until one day, Christ does come again, and we feast at his heavenly banquet for all eternity. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, whoever's going to come serve communion, come forward, and as they do, if you've never received communion here before, here's all you got to do. You don't have to earn it. You don't need a ticket. You don't have to put anything in the offering. All you do is come forward with your hand out to receive a gift, for that is what you're receiving today, the gift of resurrection power. You're going to receive a piece of bread. You dip the bread in the juice, and you receive both elements at the same time, and then you remember you have the hope, hope of Christ who was and is and is to come. (laughs) It don't matter when the day is. What matters is he was raised, and so are you, to a certain victory, a victory in Jesus. The table's been prepared.
coming after me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Go with the peace of God. Love you.